Boom, boom, boom. Literature gets a look. Let's talk about books. <laughs> Greetings and welcome, listeners, to Legs Talk About Books, Hard Leg Gaming's monthly podcast about books and literature, novels, wh- whatever we feel like. Uh, I'm I'm your host, Hard Leg Joe. Joining me today, CB Radio. Let's talk about some stories, yeah. Which, which we may also call Brandon from time to time. Yeah. And, you know, just, just to make this clear, this is the first episode. Might be a little rough. We're still experimenting with the format. I'm going to say it's going to be pretty rough. It's going to be pretty rough. I mean, I'm about to sneeze, so... Yeah, expect a lot of edits, like the awkward one you probably just heard, getting rid of that sneeze. Yeah. You know, we're, we're getting used to things. Just in general, these, these uh, first five episodes, we're going to be switching things up a lot. So give us all the feedback. Let us know what you think, what you'd like to see, what was good, what was bad. And we'll, we'll try to make this better going forward. Yeah. But anyway, for this first episode, this inaugural episode... Uh, we're actually looking at two books, the first two books in the Wheel of Time series, which are uh, The Eye of the World and The Great Hunt. Uh, um, I decided to do both of them together because the first, the, the, the Eye of the World, the first book in the series, is really weird in that, like, the beginning really sucks, in my opinion. Oh, in my and, opinion as well. And the ending really sucks. <laughs> um, and then the, the second book, like... It sucks in a way that makes you want to see what's going to happen in the second book. And then the second book, like, opens, like, dynamite opening, instantly gets you hooked, you want to see what's happening, and then the middle of that is kind of mediocre, and then it ends really awesomely in a way that sort of wraps up both. So Feels- gonna, we're just going to be talking about both of those together. Sounds like a roller coaster of interest, really. Yeah. And yeah, we should note, I have read the books, uh, Brandon has not read all the books. I originally read the first book up to about, I'd say, a third of the way through, and that, that I was... more closer to a fourth, I think, from what you described. I still, I'm still, I was still in that portion of the book that was just... Uh, yeah, the, the front is a slog to get through, which we will get to, but I, I just want to, before we get into actually discussing about the book, just sort of like spoiler free thoughts like what mm-hmm. what I thought of the book obviously we know what you thought of the book yeah you you couldn't make it through that opening crawl oh yeah yeah it, it's very slow i guess the best way to put it cuz you and me have been reading a whole lot of fantasy books lately yeah we've been devouring we've, we've just been on a fantasy book kick and i'll say that every book we've read no matter what it's like on the front or the back, there's some blurb saying, like, the successor to Lord of the Rings. Or yeah. Like, it compares it to Tolkien. And I've read Lord of the Rings, and I could safely say, out of all of them, I think Wheel of Time is the closest to Lord of the Rings. I could definitely get that. Yeah, it, it really kind of falls into this, like, timeless fantasy sort of thing, mm-hmm. where it's like, you could have read this in the 1970s, you could read it 30 years from now. It just has this quality of, like, a completely original world that's just really, really in-depthly built. And if you really want to get lost in, like, lore, in, like, a big, huge, lived-in world, and maybe things aren't necessarily cinematic at times, things can be really slow, they can be kind of realistic, I would definitely recommend Wheel of Time, especially since... We've done the two books, and there are uh, 14 total. Yeah. <laughs> if there's going to be future episodes of this, it's going to be, there are going to be a lot. This will be our uh, yeah, we'll, anthology, if anything. We'll see. I, I got a whole bunch of other books I want to read before yeah. we come back. Actually, let us know after we're done with this if you, you'd like us to read more Wheel of Time. Uh, of course, also let us know, have you read it? Would you like to read it? Mm-hmm. Um, obviously, if you, if you don't want any spoilers, go ahead and stop it here. Go check it out. This will be on the internet for a while. Hopefully forever. forever yeah, maybe. yeah, well, yeah. That, At least a couple of years. Until the internet shuts down because it uh, got owned by a, a bank or something. Yeah, yeah until yeah. Disney owns the internet yeah, yeah, and yeah. shuts down everything. <laughs> or until mm. YouTube shuts down. Uh, but yeah, go, go ahead and check that out. From here on in, we're just going to be discussing complete plot, everything. Just different stuff that I thought about. So just to start out here to explain the format we're going for, we're not really going to do a whole play-by-play of the plot. The way I see it, either you've already read it and you you know what's going to happen. Uh, And if you haven't read it, I don't want this to replace the experience of reading Wheel of Time. Really, I want this to be more of a thing where I can... We can discuss interesting parts about the book, what we liked, what we didn't like, and sort of compare it to other things we've read, other stories in general. Just just talking about what makes this book different and More of a roundtable than a a Cliff Notes, as you would say. 
It's it's more of a round table than a review, you would yeah, say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, let's let's go into the first thing I really wanted to talk about, obviously, is just the fact that Brandon did not finish the book. Yeah, I I I do have to get into that point. Um effectively I was I've been super excited about the Wheel of Time. It's 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 a fourteen page, a fourteen book series. It's been going it, on for how many it outlived the author. The, yeah, yeah. <laughs> the author uh literally uh was taken over by Brandon Sanderson, who is now specifically famous for uh more than that, but he was originally famous for taking up the mantle of that and Wheel really of time. Uh, but it's one of those series where, like, I've heard the name Wheel of Time oh, yeah. a whole lot, and I literally had no idea what it was about. Yeah, I I, uh, I work at a, a books at a place that play, uh, sells books, and I just saw it all the time. This like really interesting cover, and I, I got to it. I uh, uh, just so we know that uh, for future episodes, uh, Joe tends to read the books. I tend to listen to them on audiobook because my attention span's not as great, and I also have a lot of other. Things I'm on a big my plate. Guy. He's a big reader guy. Yeah, so in, in future episode, in this episode, we we specifically picked a book that Brandon didn't finish. In the future, uh, when we both look at books, we'll be looking at stuff like how is the audio book different from the regular book, mm, how it's strengthened, all that yeah. stuff. But that's Which, that is future endeavors for well, right it, now. It does kind of point out a little thing because it's. It's interesting that, like, despite the fact that it was an audiobook, it still couldn't keep your attention. Oh, yeah. It was very meaty. It was a lot to take in. It was... You had to slog through it. And also because it starts off in, like, this very bleak uh, scenario of evil wins. And good actually just goes out the door. And then it uh, cuts from that and goes to... Your typical beginning of a fantasy, a fantasy setting, yeah, like sh- a farm boy who has a single dad, but his dad doesn't seem like it's his dad. It's he weird. Doesn't be- yeah, it's, it's standard. Like you have a farm boy, he's probably adopted. Could he be the special one? It it seems very cliche at, at first, I'd but put they, my gold down on that. They they do some really interesting things with it. Um, but going back, it is really interesting. the The book does start with this in my opinion, really horribly written prologue that's basically like a thousand years before the story began. Mm -hmm. Here's basically like a chapter out of like one of their holy books or one of their history books uh, about an event called the breaking of the world. I thought it was written in kind of like a, like a a firsthand account, not like a, a... that that's what really bothered me about it was like parts of it were written more like a regular book and parts of it were written kind of like a holy book there's a lot of like and he said on to him you do not know me you are the one that i have fought for generations upon gen like it just has this very high weighty feel to it Mm -hmm. and it's interesting though that you mentioned you said it you you said it starts with evil winning Mm -hmm. um and to me especially going like at the time this is what i thought and then the the book kind of confirms it uh the the opening crawl is basically explaining how good and evil tie each other. Yeah. It's uh the guy, the dragon he's called, who has all these supernatural powers and the, the super great, special. The super special. He can channel their magic, which we'll get to the magic system because that's interesting as well. Oh yeah. But he basically gets fooled by the dark one and the dark one makes him kill his whole family and he doesn't realize it cuz he's like mind controlled and then when he does he channels all the magic at once and basically just like turns his entire city into a fucking mountain. Again, this is that, that for me that's just like that's too bleak. That's <laughs> holy crap. Oh my gosh. It is bleak, but I, again, I, I see it as this historical record. It, like I said, it's bleak, but it's also like it's happened. It's, e- it's already gone. Not only that, but it's like evil is like I have won. I've doomed you. And good is like if I'm going down, I will take you with me. <laughs> But in doing so, he does an event that later becomes known as the, the breaking, breaking of the world. <laughs> Dope damn name, but it's yeah. kind of overused at points, but yeah. I, I can't think of another... I, I've seen a lot of stuff where it's almost like post-apocalyptic, but this is like post, post, post... Oh yeah, you, this they, is... They make it really clear that the whole Wheel of Time thing is like circular, like the world has broken before, or at least undergone, been, undergone Young... big changes before. We do English here. I actually, uh, it does kind of, uh, you said that you don't know of another story. There is one. It's Tolkien. Tolkien really did the whole, like, it, before in the, in the Cimmerillion, it's these grand cities and these grand people, and then you get into the, the story of the Lord of the Rings. By then, the world's pretty screwed. It's pretty much like, hey, all these great things have happened. Well, yeah, that's yeah. what I often hear about people who look into, like, the history of the Lord of the Rings mm-hmm. is, 
They talk about how it's a spiral going down. Like, yeah. every, wor- every year the world gets slightly less magical. The thing about the Wheel of Time is like it, tru- it truly is a wheel. They, they, there's a lot of talk about how all these great cities have crumbled and stuff that used to be magical, people don't understand now. There's these lost relics. But there's also, in the story, which is one of the great things as it goes on, mm. basically one of the characters, uh, Perrin, kind of discovers, like, oh, he has this power that's older than all the other powers, something that was gone long ago and now is coming back. Mm-hmm. Something that, like, even the ancients didn't know about. And so you get this idea of, like, yeah, some things are gone, but also some new things are happening that have the potential to be even greater than that. So, yeah, it's kind of like this idea of uh, the interesting parts of the world. Yes, they're going to go through a cycle. It's going to be that moment of, yeah. oh, there's going to be ups and downs. And that that's the thing. Like it It's weird because Lord of the Rings has this triumphant tone through a lot of it, even though it's supposed to be spiraling down. It's like people doing the best despite the fact and Wheel of Time has this this very much like, we're here doing the same thing again, and you're going to be stuck doing the same thing again. Especially near, near the, I guess, right around where you left. That's the actually the point I was going to get on there, There's a point where, like, the characters really feel like they're trapped. Mm-hmm. Um, when they start out, like, they're, they're just normal farming boys. There's actually three characters. All of them could be the special, and they all have to leave. And they all end up being special in different ways. But uh, like they get, you all are who are listening. Yeah, you're all you're all very nice. It's very special. But they they get picked up by a wizard, for lack of a better term. <laughs> they're called I Sedai here, which is which is kind of a cool name. But, but they're, they're really they're really into gender equality, and so they're all women. <laughs> Not really. That, that's a whole other interesting. I really like that kind of like. At first, I was like, why have the gendered aspect? And then it makes sense. Oh yeah, it makes perfect it. sense. So. But yeah, they, they get picked up by a wizard. And the wizard is like, you have to follow me or you're going to be dead. And so they're pretty much forced into doing it. And then, like, the Dark One appears in their dreams and they're like, if you follow me or if you follow them, you're going to be dead. And if you die, you belong to me because I'm the Lord of Death. And it it gets you very depressed. Oh, yeah. You super. really feel like I am a slave to, to time, to destiny. Um, which can feel like a really big bummer, especially when it seems like that's what the book's about. Yeah, that again, that's where it starts yeah. off with that, and then it kind you, of You spins. get into that, I was like, I'm really not feeling this. And then they, like, basically, they start with this big group. It's the three of them, plus the wizard. The mm-hmm. wizard has an assistant. They pick up, essentially, a bard. <laughs> the best character in the story, the by the way. The best character, whose name I can't remember. Thom. Right. Thom, Thom yes. and Marillion or something. He's awesome. He's everything that a rogue bard should be. Yeah. He's tricky. He's smart. He's smarmy. And he uses daggers. He and, uses throwing knives. It's pretty neat. And he sings better than you. Yeah. <laughs> he's just better he than you. He tells good stories. Although, I, what was it? Actually, in, in the second book, they meet bards. He's not a bard. He's a gleeman. gleeman yes. And he, he makes a fact of like, Oh, bards think they're so good, but Gleemans really know how to do it. Like, <laughs> all bards can do is sing. Gleemans know how to tell a story and sing and juggle and Gleeman, do tumbles. Gleeman is a prestige class, okay? <laughs> I had to go to, I went to bard college, and now I'm a Gleeman. Yeah, Gleeman, they're kind of like traveling. They, they make a note of like they have this big jacket that's full of patches and has pockets everywhere. Uh, I believe the, the line that describes the cloak that he has is, there are more colors than he knew that existed yeah. <laughs> on that cloak. And I'm like, wow, that's impressive. Yeah, Admittedly, so, these are farmers, and all I know are browns and grays, but go. Yeah, so he ends up joining. The main character's girlfriend ends up joining, and then it turns out she's got, like, the one power that she could be an a- Aes Sedai. And then also their their village wisdom, who's this other, like, 20-year-old woman, she chases after them, and she gets involved with them. And you end up with this party of, like, what, well, eight people? Mm-hmm. There's this big party, and all of them kind of feel doomed. And then they get separated. And that's really when the story picks up and gets super interesting. You get to develop all the characters and, like, individuals. Mm-hmm. Uh, you find out about, like, their other powers and what makes them unique. And plus just the way, like, when the main character, Rand, when he's stuck basically between the Aes Sedai and the Dark One, he just feels trapped. Yeah. But then he gets separated, and suddenly it's him, his friend, and the Gleeman riding on a pirate boat down the seas, learning how to juggle and play the flute. 
And it doesn't sound like that would be interesting, but it ends up being far more interesting than you would think. <laughs> far more interesting than you're trapped, you're doomed, your life sucks. Yeah. And then, like, Perrin, like, so Rand has two friends. He has Perrin, the big kind of slow, brutish one, um, who's like the gentle giant, and Matt, who's the like, the, yeah, he's the smarmy, quick, little asshole thief jester guy. The guy who doesn't listen to anyone and really should. Who really, really should. should. Who's really, I, my opinion, the word. I really liked Perrin. Oh, obviously. I, I really, yeah. Yeah, just... He's the big, he's thoughtful guy. And I, sadly, but... I'm always the guy who likes milk toast. Yeah. I'm, I'm the guy who's like, oh, yeah, that character is, he's smart, he's strong, and he's kind. And he's like, yeah, but he doesn't really do anything interesting. But he's a good person. Yeah. Well, the, the interesting thing, he and uh, the one... He and Rand's girlfriend, essentially, mm-hmm. they get trapped together and they start wandering Perrin, through the woods. Yeah, Perrin and Rand's girlfriend, uh, Eg- Egwin. I, I never knew how to pronounce her I, name. It's been a while since I've listened to it. That's the one thing that's going to be different in audiobooks to, to actual books. I'm going to know how to say them. Yeah. <laughs> or at least how uh, the person who read it says them. Yeah. I, I always just called her Egg because her name starts with E-G. I think it's like Egwin or uh, I, Egwin. I, 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 I don't I didn't, know. I didn't I'm just going to call her this. Egg. Perrin and Egg... They get trapped, they start walking into the forest, and then they meet this, like, guy who can, like, who lives in, like, a barbarian who lives in the woods and, like, can speak telepathically to the wolves. And then, like, the more time, he's like, oh, yeah, I'll help you out, and they travel with him, and the more time Perrin spends with him, the more he starts to, like, hear the wolves in his head. And, like, he has dreams where the Dark One comes to visit him, but the wolves, like, protect him. Mm -hmm. And then soon he can, like, see in the nighttime and stuff like that. And so you've got this interesting, I, he's the one I'm most interested in, because he is this, like, I'm just a calm guy, I'm a blacksmith, I'm all about society, I want to build things. And you have literally, like, nature is like, but you belong out in the woods, you're a feral animal who needs to hunt and to taste put it back, blood. To put it back to another point, this is the character that's uh, developing something that had previously been lost. Yeah, that's what they're they're talking about, like, they're like, oh, is this something to do with the Aes Sedai? And they're like... The Wolf Brothers were something that existed long before man built his first city. Yeah. Which so, is also, yeah, like the, the uh, I again didn't read into it, but then I, uh, after we started talking about this, I looked up some of the stuff, and the timeline for it is really interesting because, like you said, it's very cyclical, but yet at the same time every, downward slightly. Oh, is it? Yeah, well, not I mean not downward slightly, but there's all these, like, the cities in this are getting less big. But they are still, like, grand cities. They're not... Yeah. You you get the idea that we're sort of, like, at the bottom of the wheel and we're about to start going up again. Mm -hmm. I have a feeling, like, once you get to the 14th book, they're building cities that are better than used to exist. But I don't know until we get there. We have to get through the rest of the wheel. Either way, my, my whole point with this was just sort of like... Yes, when you get to where Brandon is, it's very dark. I Keep going. I Yeah, if you keep going, then you get wolf stuff. <laughs> <laughs> then you get pirate adventures. Joe 2019, then you, you get wolf stuff. Then you get cursed daggers. You get all sorts of... You get to meet Loyal, Lo- who's a uh, ogreer. Awesome, who, awesome idea. It? I wish I'd actually gotten to that guy. Yeah, he, he oh, reads a lot of books. You, you describe um, it, man. Kind of like an ant mixed with an ogre. Mm-hmm. It's just like a big... The ogres are just like big, tall. They live like a thousand years. They're, they very much got that thing where like, oh, humans are always so rash running about. I'll spend a few weeks thinking about what I want to do before I do it. Like, e- Except for Loyal is the one who's like... He's like, I wanted to leave, but they're like, you're too young. You're only 199. They said they would think about it, and after waiting a few months, I rashly ran off on my own, and they don't know if I'm gone yet. <laughs> now, my favorite thing is how uh, how you first uh, learn of him. He apparently got to a city, and they find him in like this study, and he's just like, uh, a whole bunch of people were upset about me and all this stuff, so I'm going to wait here for a couple of years, yeah. and then... Like he's just gonna toss off a couple of years and just. Meh. I'm just gonna spend a few years at this inn until people get used to the fact that I'm here, because people think he's a troll arc, which is the big, they're evil race, they're essential orcs. Mm-hmm. Orc, um, if you their own little blend. Yeah, which is actually the next the next thing I uh, I wanted to talk about because the troll arcs. They're almost what got me to get through the really brutal part okay. of the the really slow part of the opening story. 
Because troll arcs show up really early. Oh, yeah. And I, I may call them troll orcs from time to time, because... That's how they're spelled, isn't it? No, there's no R. Uh, Trollocs. It's Trolloc. Yeah, that's how they pronounced it in the audiobooks. They were Trollocs. Yeah, I, I read it really fast the first couple times, and I thought it was troll orcs, and I was like, oh, they're part troll, part orc. Yeah. Uh, oh, orcs. man. Um, but yeah, when they when they first show up, it's like out of the nowhere. You spend the first like four chapters with Rand just like walking through his village doing villager things because mm-hmm. they just have to establish. They got to give you that farm boy feel. Yeah, because that, that's I was surprised to learn you got out of the village because that was what almost got me was just this like basically four chapters of exposition. Admittedly, where they're explaining the village by going through it and talking to everyone. Admittedly, when I heard most of this, I was going through an inventory, which was like <laughs> six in the morning till like nine. I have four hours to just shoot down the crapper. So I was oh. just like, I went through it and found it was okay. Yeah, the, the the beginning part's really early, and then they sort of kick you. They're like, he goes to the village, he comes home, he and his dad are just chilling out at home, and then fucking Trollarchs just attack in the middle of the night, and he has to, like, make a deadly escape, and he almost dies. And then they get back to the village, and you find, like, a whole army of them attacked the village, and the the newcomer that they thought was just a very pretty lady summoned fireballs and lightning out of the sky and killed she a bunch of them. She, in fact, was a wizard! A wizard! An ace wizard. And yeah, yeah, yeah. Beauty and power in one package. <laughs> but yeah, the, the thing about the troll arcs that, like, I basically kept reading because I wanted to know more about them. Mm-hmm. And I was disappointed, but they're, they're, they have a really interesting design because they're these fearsome creatures and they're described as being, like, man beasts. But yeah. the one that they initially run into, the one that tries to, like, bust open their door at, like, one in the morning, yeah. is, like, a goat man. Where they're like, he's got human hands and like a human mouth, or no, like a human eyes, but his mouth is sort of like a muzzle a little bit, and he's got like, he doesn't have sharp teeth. Like I said, he's a goat, he's got like horns and stuff, and like one of his feet is a hoof and one isn't. Oh, I, I, yeah, I don't remember the half foot there, but they, yeah. They, they talk about like, well, well, more of them come in, and they talk about like, oh, some of them have beaks, some of them have regular feet, some of them have two hooves. Some have, like, a third arm that's, like, vestigial and just sort of hangs out. Some have tails. So it's pretty much just like, hey, we ran out of human parts. <laughs> Why don't we just put some animal hands on here? Yeah. Some... Well, that's what you you initially you eventually find out that basically, like, the Dark One just made them. They're just monsters. <laughs> as far as I know, maybe they'll reveal more about it. But when they first showed up, I thought it was so interesting that they would basically pick, like, an herbivore, mix it with a human... And that would be scary. Mm-hmm. Because when you think of it, like, Goat Man bursts in and is like, You been kicked by a goat? I'd be afraid of that. Like, it, it, just something about that initial scene is so scary, even though it's like, it's a goat. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah. Goats aren't scary. Um, and then they mention, like, oh, Trollarchs, they just kill for fun. Yeah. They do, they're not, like, even when they're not hungry, they will just Fucking slaughter you for and fun. Te- te- tear you apart. And it, it really got me thinking of, like, hmm like evolutionary wise which again tur- they turned out to be monsters but yeah yeah an, an interesting idea for a race like what if you had a race of basically like herbivore creatures in a world full of all these predators and the only way they survived was by being brutally violent towards anything <laughs> that came near them just like uh, they evolved to think killing is fun because the only ones that survived were the ones that killed anything that got near to their home evolutionary sadism yeah <laughs> essentially so you end up with this whole race of creatures that is just, like, eternally running around, trying to kill everything, trying to be as brutal as possible. Super metal. Just for no reason. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> just because that's just, just how they were raised. It, it, I think that would work really <laughs> it's well. It's a product of their raising. It's not a product of their genetics, Joe. <laughs> But yeah, I, I just thought like that would be a really cool idea for a like a, oh, yeah, the... a science fiction like you find an alien race and they're like horribly brutal. But instead of being like the big bloodthirsty monsters, they're like the really meek race that had to be brutal to survive. I like the idea of something that just slaughters ten people, then goes over to like the salad bar and just starts eating. Just... He's, he's covered in blood, tries to wipe it off, be like, I don't like the taste of that, and just like gets his <laughs> tong, starts tossing a salad, and. Mm. Mm, the berries are quite nice. Yeah, or just like a quadruped. I, I, I was talking with Drew about this. He was comparing it to Mass Effect. It's like, imagine if the big elephant guys, mm-hmm. instead of being slow lumbering beasts, were like the most ferocious 
Yes. Like, deadly things that you could imagine. Admittedly, in that series, they kind of are, because they were such big creatures, they strapped giant cannons to their back, but yeah. Yeah, but they weren't, like, mean and violent oh, yeah, and yeah, yeah. bloodthirsty. But, yeah, that, that I just wanted to bring that up, because it was a really good example of, like, how you can read a book, and, yeah, in this case, it disappointed me with the explanation, but I still came away with an idea that made me think about yes. something that I never would have thought about. Because even in, like, bad fiction, you can still find good things. Admittedly, this is not bad fiction. Yeah. It's just, like, even in bad fiction, you can find things well, that mean, are... Even, pick- even in a story I liked, there's all sorts of bad stuff. But even the stuff I don't like yeah. still has good qualities. And uh, to put a fine point on that, that's kind of going to be the point of these uh, podcasts is... Uh, even in, in any kind of fiction, you can yeah. find some interesting stuff. Just trying to find the, the interesting, unique things about the story. Even if it failed, what made it fail? Mm-hmm. Like, what made the troll arcs fail to me? That that they just ended up being monsters instead of trying to find a cool explanation for them. Although, again, 12 more books, maybe they explain them in an interesting way. That, and also, this was written, like, 30 years ago. Yeah. Yeah, so... I mean, evolution was still known. Yeah, but there's... And, yeah, but we're, uh, we're, we're getting on a tangent, way. yeah. Well, going back, actually, because we were talking about the, the slow openings. Yeah. There's one thing I forgot to bring, because I forget, did you did you ever uh, listen to Lord of the Rings or read Lord of the Rings? The uh, oddly enough, uh, I got, uh, when the initial movies came out, I watched the first one, was so enamored with it, heard that there was the second one coming out, I decided the library got uh, a two towers. I got it, and I began reading it, and I got all the way up to the part where they talked about Ents. And I couldn't. I couldn't get past that. <laughs> Admittedly, uh, up until the films came out, I thought Ents were giant stone creatures, which kind of messes with you it. You maybe but... weren't paying attention. To yeah, I was. I, had, I have a lot of ADD yeah. issues. Times. Well, I mean, to be fair with our age, when the movies came out, I believe I was in like middle school or like early high school. Something you were like in that. early high school. I was in like the mid, uh, mid to last. Yeah, time, so it might have been a little too early for us, but... Yeah, that, that was the thing I remember. If you've never read the Lord of the Rings books, the, the first book, you get, like, halfway through before they get to, like, the Prancing Pony or whatever it is, that first... <laughs> Oof, that's which a t- bit of a distance. Which is, like, ten minutes in the, the, the movie. The mm. movie glosses over a whole lot of the beginning. Also, yeah, the the part where uh, uh, Gandalf just rides away, comes back, that's 40 years. <laughs> He's literally... Like, Frodo's literally, like, 45 by the time that happens. Yeah, but hobbits age differently yeah yeah but e- either way my point is lord of the rings is like the the classic fantasy novel it's mm-hmm. one who knows how many awards everyone loves it and it's done that despite the fact that the beginning is painfully slow like utterly completely just like you don't get into anything resemble you don't even get the team together to like three-fourths of the way out the book <laughs> then there's the balrog fight and then, like <laughs> the titular fellowship's only in there for a third of the book. Yeah, yeah. the fellow like the book ends with like the fellowship of the ring coming together and then breaking apart. Mm-hmm. And it's really weird to think that like going through Wheel of Time, the first five chapters almost had me dropping out, had you drop out. Mm-hmm. And like by comparison, it's really speedy. <laughs> yeah, it just makes me. I'm not even sure if I have an answer to this question, but like. How come Lord of the Rings can have the super slow intro and make it work? And what about Wheel of Time makes it tedious? Admittedly, it's because of the product of what it was back when it came out. Because uh, Wheel of Time is 1970. I, I don't remember exactly. I think, I it's think like it was late 80s. Actually. Late 80s. Uh, uh, Lord of the LOTR started in the 40s to 50s. It was brought out then. It was, it was the revolutionary at its time. So you and, think people just had more attention spans? It, it wasn't then, so much a more attention spans as it was this was new. This was different. Because uh, the world that he was breathing out wasn't some, here's fantasy, here's just something like this. It Here was, we are on the planet of matter, muncher lad, where he e- everyone eats things. Yeah. <laughs> Eats things, whatever. They're like, oh no, I'm going to take some time, build it up a little bit. He actually, he was... Kind of crazy because he made his own language and is just there are videos stuff. and in and, and podcasts yeah. about how crazy and how uh, in in depth uh, Tolkien got about the hell they're making a movie about it yeah um, yeah like I know it was influential it's it's just weird to think that from a technical standpoint you could have something so boring and so slow be so successful well again again looking through all the other novels we read they start out like quick. 
a lot, especially the newer ones, it's sort of like, they, they really got you like, you got to hook the readers, you got to get them in, you got to let them know stuff is happening, interesting things right out the bat. That's actually one thing I like about fantasy is that you don't actually have to have a hook every time. Because there's going to be a, some books that we talk about in here that the hook isn't the greatest. I just feel like every other book, uh, like Lies of Locke Lamour, Name of the Wind, uh, Furies of Calderon, like first... Previews first... for future episodes. <laughs> first five chapters there was a fight scene of some kind yeah there was a battle or someone was almost died and then like barely survived due to some sort of trickery or or some sort of like fighting or something like that and this one like yeah you you get to the troll arcs but that's like six chapters in mm-hmm. and even then that like doesn't really capture your attention as much as you'd hope it does and admittedly uh like the lord of the rings uh th- yeah like you don't get the ring race until the d- prancing pony after you've had like waiting 40 years for gandalf mm-hmm. and then getting ready and then leaving and then running into tom bombadil and fucking <laughs> around with him for a while and then getting to the town and sauron then- could not touch him yeah <laughs> it was very strange um but no yeah the the it I was going to say to 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 put the point of uh, to rest a little bit on that it's like the all the stories afterwards have built on that and actually have streamlined the process more and that's why yeah. we're getting more stories like that. Immediately uh having a, a hook is not a new it wasn't a new idea in 1940 but it was taking this idea of this breathing solid world and then taking that and then saying let's cut away all of this extra <laughs> like let's cut the let's the cut Tom Bombadil out cuz i really don't understand how he's important to the story <laughs> and they did it for the movies yeah and then just like getting to the meatier parts to the parts that you're just like wow this is the stuff that readers really want to hear yeah it'll be interesting comment on the comments if you have an opinion on the matter so jumping back again we're jumping back and forth a lot I wanted to talk about, uh, again, the interesting ideas that that uh, the Wheel of Time sort of brings up. In the case of the Troll Arcs, we had something that, like, you started with a really cool idea, and then it ended up just sort of, like, fizzling out. The explanation is just, yeah, they're, yeah. they're monsters. You uh, don't really get much. Something that turned out to be the opposite was uh, the, the idea of the Mirror Worlds, which I'm not sure if I've... You and me have talked about this book a lot, yeah, just, yeah. like, in, in spare time. Which is part of why we wanted to make this podcast because we're like we talk know, about we books too much. This people might like it. We talk about books a lot, but yeah, in the second book, they make a big deal of like uh, they're they're trying to hunt down this guy. They find this weird stone pillar, and through through things that I don't want to get into, they magic trans- shenanigans. It, magic shenanigans. That's the best way to explain mm-hmm. it. Via magic shenanigans, they are teleported to a parallel world that is like their world, but like not quite. Um, it's kind of like the upside down in uh, uh, Stranger Things. I don't know. I haven't seen that. Essentially, in that, there it's uh, literally the world, but the everything's like covered in moss and overgrown and just kind of darker, and it's it's got this kind of like uh, weird ash floating upwards as opposed to going down. Huh. Yeah, it, it, it's it's uh, a, a trope used a lot where it's the world, but it's not the world. Yeah, well, I mean, kind of, but they also make clear that, like, so that, like, again, they find this pillar, and it's got all these symbols on them, Mm -hmm. and you find out that, like, every symbol is an alternate world. Yeah. Like, not just, like, there is an alternate world. Like, if there was just a shadow world, that would be fine. Um, This is like, no, there are infinite possibility worlds, and I'm like, we're in the second book in... And you're and already bringing in, like, an infinite multivo- a multiverse of, like, different things. Like, this is going to get really complicated. It, it's hard to explain, because, like, the world they're in, on, on the one hand, it does kind of represent an alternate universe. Mm-hmm. They make a big deal of, like, in their universe, they're headed towards this area, and it's like, it was once a huge monument where a big army defeated a whole bunch of troll arcs. And they wrote the name of everyone who died on it, this huge spire. Mm-hmm. And then after that king died, even though it didn't have his name on it, they tore it down. And then they're traveling in this world and they see this huge spire and they're like, oh, in this world it didn't get torn down. They run up to get it and they get there and it's a big spire with troll arc stuff written all over it. They're like, Phil. oh, in this world they, they lost. They have the, oh, there's Bob, there's Phil, <laughs> troll arcs. Uh, Stacy Trollock, yeah, they were very progressive. Yeah. So it's like it's kind of an alternate world, but at the same time, it's also like you get the idea that this world isn't like a stable world. Mm-hmm. They always talk about like everything has sort of like a Cephia filter to it. 
they don't use that term, but they're like, everything's kind of like... Blurry. Not blurry, but they're like, it's less intense. Less out of... Like, it's like out of every, focus. Everything's washed. All the colors are washed mm-hmm. out. Um, and they also talk about like, yeah, there, there is this weird thing where they're like, if you're staring right ahead, everything's fine. But if you like try to turn your head, things that are far away look like they're moving towards you. Ooh. Like when you're not looking at them, they're like, it's very trippy. You got to kind of keep your head down. Those with heart, weak hearts and, uh, not, uh, motion problems, please do not go yeah. into the mirror world. <laughs> do not go into the mirror world. And then they come out and they find out that like the place they came out. They walked for, like, two days and came out, like, a week's travel ahead of uh, where they... They came out ahead of the guy they were chasing. It's like the nether. Yeah, it's kind of like the nether in that way. So, but but in that way, it's sort of like, oh, that's not just, like, an alternate world. That's a world that, like, was never really a fully fleshed-out world to begin with. Its physics are only one-fifth of what actual physics are. Like most of the stories <laughs> I write. So it's just weird, but yeah, it's just like... Basically, what they needed to do was teleport the crew in front of them. Mm-hmm, so mm-hmm. I'm like, from a practical sense, this was just fast travel. But then from a story sense, they had to bring in this whole nonsense of alternate worlds that, like, this is going to make everything really murky. And then what they ended up doing with it was, like, almost brilliant. Mm-hmm. Because as the story reaches yeah. its climax, they need to get across the world. Like, they need to go to, like, the complete other side of the map that they're on. And they're like, we can't do this. And they're like, but we have the, the stones. They're like, the mirror world is not just like, like, it doesn't just take you to a mirror world. It could take you to the same world in different parts. The stones are connected. They're like, if you use magic, you could teleport. But no one's done it in like years and years and years. But they're like, you did it once. You went to the mirror world. So <laughs> use it to teleport from here across the world. And he's like, okay, <laughs> I will try. And he does it. They come out on the other side of the world. Uh, it, they appear a month later, though. So it's, it takes yeah. them a month anyway. Um, but it, it would have been like six months if they actually... Yeah, 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 yeah. But the thing is, basically, when it transports them, it also takes them through all the alternate worlds at the same time. And it so he has this... The space. It has a... There's like a montage where the main character is like... He sees himself growing up in the farming village... And the troll arcs come, and he decides not to leave. And then he grows old, and he marries his girlfriend, but something feels, like, wrong. And then, at the end, like, the world is coming to an end. Like, all the stuff that happened, all the evil stuff wins and starts rolling down. And he has a final battle where he fights against, like, a bunch of troll arcs and dies. Yeah. Just as, like, a farmer. And then, like, he has another rife where he leaves, and then he starts walking, and then his friend dies instead of going with him. So he gets separated and he ends up becoming a guard for the queen and he learns that he has magical powers, but he never learns to harness them. So like he fights against evil a little sooner, but he still dies. Yeah. And then there's, he just basically goes through all these like, what if scenarios? Writer's like, here's the ideas I had. Here's the, (laughs) I become a guard and I die. Matt dies. I die. He does stuff where it's like, everything's the same except for his one friend decides to leave. And then like 30 years down the road, he realizes he would have needed his one friend. Yeah. And it, it basically comes to realize that, like, the this group... This is the perfect... The group that they're in is, like, the perfect group, and he needs to protect everyone. You can't leave anyone behind. You have a cleric, you have a ranger, you have... Yeah. A... <laughs> and it's like, and not just for moral reasons, but because literally the world will end if one of you gets separated. <laughs> no pressure. No pressure. But it really does, it cements that, but not only that, he arrive, they, they arrive, but he's in a group with, like, 40 other people. And everyone else is had the same thing happen to them. Yeah. His friend, like, runs over them. He's like, Rand, Rand, I would never betray you. I understand. <laughs> and it's like, you have this moment where everyone gets to see the repercussions of all the actions they were thinking about taking. And, and like, it, it, it does so much to inform their characters that the last chapter is so epic. Because everyone now realizes exactly how important their situation momentous is. Momentous this is. How yeah. momentous it is. And it really adds to sort of like the hype of it. And then most importantly, there's a, the start of the second book, the part that made me super invested. Mm-hmm. There's a part at the very beginning, the, like a pre- prologue, where it's basically like the dark evil one is having a meeting of all his secret conspirators. And it's a room with like 200 people in it, and they're all in disguise. Yeah, well, you, you meet with a guy who's, like, in disguise like everyone else, but he's remarking, oh, my disguise is so good. I could see 
that person's got a ring of the Ace of Die on. Like, there are yeah. Ace of Die here. There are Royals here. Spoilers. There are guards here. There are, like, all the... You don't know exactly who. Mm-hmm. That's what's so great. It builds this tension because it immediately sets up the fact that, like, there anyone... There are eyes on every side. There are eyes everywhere. There yeah. are evil people everywhere. The Dark One has all these minions. And who is the guy who kept himself completely hidden? And they, you actually find out, don't you, you? You do find out that it's basically the the general in charge of leading them on the great hunt that they're on. Because mm-hmm. he makes a big deal about like he says he's going to work for the Dark One, but he's not really working for the Dark One. He serves a greater cause. And then you find out later on that basically they're they're trying to get this sacred artifact called the Great Horn. Yeah, and he's like. I will lead the charge, but then I'll take the horn and I'll get the glory and I'll use it to defeat the Dark One in the way that the the main character couldn't. And then after this, he comes out and he is just like vomiting on the floor. He is like pale. And then later on, they're like trying to run. They're like, there's no way we can outrun them. And he's like, I'll stay and fight. And he basically turns to Ran and he's like, I saw it. I saw what happens if I get the horn. It's never enough. Nothing I did was ever enough. Like this I is put after myself the, on yeah, this is after that where he vomited after coming out of the uh, yeah the after mirror. this is long after the the mirror worlds and everything, but he just sort of reveals he's like I like I was I would have betrayed you I was this close to betraying you but I realize no matter what I do how clever I am I can't deal with darkness and not get betrayed like I will always lose I've seen myself lose a million times over. Like, at least let me do this one thing. Let me let lose me, with on my terms. Let me lose with honor. This mm-hmm. is the only option I have. And it, it turned this, like, nothing character into, like, one of the best epic redemption stand, yeah. epic stories. Where it's like, I thought they were going to take the multiple universes and make it murky. Oh, there's an alternate version of this guy, or an alternate version of this, or... Oh, this monster you thought was dead is actually alive mm-hmm. in another dimension. And his now your main character has <laughs> red hair instead yeah. of blonde. Uh, and, and instead, what they did was use it as a way to show them their choices. Their choices. How their choices. How, despite the fact that they feel like they're stuck in destiny, their choices are of the utmost significance. Yeah. And it brings everything back. To where this story that you thought was about destiny is about choice after all. Yeah. And I loved it. <laughs> yeah. Kind of like... Uh, Sorry, that was a super long roundabout way. Much like a wheel. Uh, Go ahead, what were you going to say? Oh, no, I was going to say, it kind of reminds me of... Uh, I haven't read Dune, but it kind of... I have watched a couple of videos on it, and... Uh, <laughs> Uh, that the story of Dune, uh, with its dynamic leaders, was a like a kind of a warning against uh, like charismatic leaders, against people thinking they could they they were better than everyone else. Yeah, sort of in the same way that guy was like, oh, I can outsmart the Dark One, and I mm-hmm. can do this, and I can, I know better than everyone else. One the the story about something is the antithesis of it, just to make you uh just to make you keep you on your toes. That's good writing. Yeah. And it, 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 it really got me interested to see how things go from there. But anyway, I, enough about that. There is there, Here's something that I think would be a little, little more input on your end. Sorry for talking to you. Hey, off, hey, man. good stories, good talk. Let's keep going. Yeah. Um. The the one thing I, I mentioned, like, the beginning of the story, super interesting. The mm-hmm. end of the story, super interesting. Middle, I didn't not even so cover, much. I didn't even cover the fights. The middle, really boring. Yeah. Didn't like it. Uh... And one of the biggest things that I didn't like about it was a character known as Celine, who is, uh, let, let me just set this up for you. Rand and a couple of his friends accidentally find themselves in the weird mirror world where everything's Again. washed out. Oh. No, the first time. Oh, the first time? The first time they find themselves in the mirror world. They have no idea how they got there. They're just trying to find their way out. They're wandering in the same direction. They're like, we'll find another stone and we'll get out. And then they meet a beautiful woman in a long, flowing white dress, and she's being attacked by a monster. And she's like, oh, someone please help me. And they go and defend it, and she's like, oh, you must be a great knight, a great man. 
tell me about all your adventures. And Rand is like, oh, she's so pretty. I pretty much just better tell her everything about me. <laughs> better just tell her all my stories. And even the, the Ogrier is with them. And even he's like, I'm not into humans, but she's very pretty. So I'm yeah. going to tell her everything. <laughs> Beauty is a, is a tool. And then, and then they, they get to the stone and she's like, oh, you got to use the stone to get back using your powers and there's a whole thing about his powers are corrupting him mm-hmm. his powers are it's bad when he uses his powers he shouldn't use them um when she like keeps like oh you got to use your powers he's like now nah, we'll figure out another way and then suddenly like four of those monsters that attacked her come out of nowhere and attack them and rand has to fight him and he barely wins but he doesn't use his powers no he doesn't use his power she's like Use your powers and defeat them! And he finds a way to do it with just a bow and arrow because he's kind of badass in that, that <laughs> scene. Um, and then he's like, look, we're safe. And then you, he's like, I can hear 30 more in the distance. They're coming. You better use your powers to get us out of here. Look, lady. No. no, the whole time he's just like, I don't really want to, but you're so pretty. <laughs> <laughs> and then they get out and she's like, oh, you're going after the great horn? I'll go with you, even though I'm supposedly a noble woman who got lost in the mirror world somehow. Some way. Yeah. In a way I didn't explain. And then they, they go and get the... And the whole time she's like, no, you can't meet up with your teammates. You've got to go get the horn right now. Claim it for yourself. Be the king that everyone needs you to be. You're a noble man. Use your powers! <laughs> this lady sounds really suspicious. She's, she is the most... Clearly evil person I have ever seen in a book, and no one calls her on it. Not a single goddamn character ever is like, I wonder why she wants me to use my powers so but, but, bad. But, 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 she's hot. <laughs> she is very hot. So in place. In That's, place. <laughs> It's, it's all it's, good. It's all good. They, they, I think they mentioned that she's like, maybe she casts a spell on them or something. She's some kind of... She's some kind I of... I put a spell on you. Yeah, yeah. What was it? She's not an Aes Sedai. Because she's like, Aes Sedai are evil, sadistic beasts, and they deserve to be slain. Which is not uncommon for people in the Wheel of Time world. <laughs> They're just very... A, a lot of people are super afraid of wizards. Uh, but who isn't, really? Yeah, it, it's... It is one of those things that makes the world building really interesting. Like, in Rand's podunk town, like, down in the south, people don't even think wizards exist. They're and when they find out one, they're like, just go away, we want nothing <laughs> to do with you. We and barely want to believe, we like, we barely want to believe in our folk tales and yeah. crap. And then you go to, like, another town, and they're like, oh, the ace to die, hey, we need some people who, we got some people who need healing, you could do that. Like, mm-hmm. it's good luck to have you around. And then you go to another place, and they're like, Oh, Ace Sedai, you communicate with the one power. You should be killed on sight. If you're even sus- if they even suspect you of being an Ace Sedai, they will kill you. It it's it it really makes things diverse. There's so many like fantasy stories where it's like, I'm a wizard and there's everyone has the same exact response to it. I respect you. Yeah. I respect you. I respect you. I or respect I, fear you. I fear you. I fear you. I fear yeah, yeah. And yeah, it it's just interesting that like basically every town has their own lore about it. But yeah, I'm, I'm like getting off. Universe, I'm getting yeah. off topic. Uh, the, Celine, the point is clearly evil. Clearly evil. None of the characters notice. It is so frustrating to hear them like constantly be like, "Oh, okay, Celine." But she was I in a white dress. Safe. Yeah, she's perfectly fine. She's perfectly fine. Or like, at one point she leaves, and then Rand spends like so much time. Like, I wonder where Celine is. I hope she comes back. She's so pretty. <laughs> Like, does, no. does she actually? Does he actually use those words? Like essentially, he might as well have used those words. The, I'm, I'm pretty sure he calls her beautiful like hundreds of times okay, in right. the, the course of the story. At least that there's there there. It's not like heavy handed. Like oh, uh, her, she's just talking about pieces of her. Like just thinking about it. No, he's just like oh, she's pretty. She's so beautiful. He talks about like I speak to her, and my heart just starts thumping, and I can't think straight. My hands get all clammy. He gets. He thinks about his girlfriend, and then he's like, "Eh, she would be really mad if she knew the things I was thinking about." Celine. <laughs> like, I almost kissed her. Oh, jeez. Mm-hmm. Um, oh, Nissan, notice me, <laughs> notice me, senpai. But the the thing she brings up is, I, I'm always reminded of uh, Hitchcock. He famously talked about uh, what it means to build tension. I believe it is, mm-hmm. or what like dramatic tension is. Yeah, and that's like. Two people are having a conversation, there's a bomb under the table, and only the audience knows there's a bomb. 
And so there's tension in the audience knowing that something bad is going to happen when the characters are oblivious to it. It's literally every scene where uh, a character like looks in a mirror, uh, uh, opens it up. It you see something, something spooky behind it. Yeah, they close it, they, they bend down to spit, and then you see something, boom, appear. And there's like, it's just this, the character doesn't know, but you know. But you know, and that's what sort of builds tension. Mm-hmm. But it's one of those things where it's like, when it's done correctly, it could be really effective. Mm-hmm. But with this, it's like, I was just so annoyed. It was so frustrating <laughs> the entire time. And I'm trying to think, like, what's the fine line between, like, at what point does screaming at them, you're in trouble, become, become tedious become tedious instead of, like, tension building? Or, or uh, for me, this sounds like it's great character building because it's just uh, the idea that these characters haven't the ability to get past this. But uh, it also does make it feel like the characters are less because of it. Yeah. I, I, I can't really give you a good balance of it because there haven't been a lot of characters and stories that I've just been like, oh, I don't trust them. <laughs> that person's shady. I really don't like them. It's real, not since Xehanort have I seen a character that was like so clearly evil. <laughs> yes. You can trust me. Mm-hmm. Clearly, Worm Tongue knows what's best for the. Guy. Yeah. Oh yeah. That there's a character right there that's just like, oh god, he's pale. He looks like he's gonna yeah. die, and he looks. Well, it's like- obviously like the king was under his spell, but like everyone else knew. Mm-hmm. But the king wields power, and you can't I mean, that, really stop. That's the it. thing. I'm trying to remember who else, because it's like, I, I believe some woman meets up with her at some point, and she's just like, wow, she's really beautiful. <laughs> <And> I'm like. <laughs> It doesn't no no it doesn't matter who's there. No one's the voice of reason. Somebody, Everyone is Somebody take the pendant off of her. She's got something that gives her plus 5 to charisma. Yeah. Shut it. When you got 20 charisma, you could just hang out anywhere. Mhm. What the the worst part of it? The only bad part about the ending of the book. At the very end, uh Rand sword fights the dark one. And uh this is the the first one, right? The second one. The second one. Okay. The second one. The first one he j- just shoots a beam at him and kills him. <laughs> And then he's in the second one, nope. and I'm not sure if it's the same dark no one skill. or not. Yeah, the the second one, it's if, if you'll allow me to talk about the climax real quick. Oh, please do. I'll sit back. He he and a whole bunch of people go charging into this city, and suddenly, like, there's a supernatural mist, and he finds himself like in a void, like like in his dreams, but he's awake, and the dark one is in front of him, and he pulls out his sword and he starts like sword fighting the dark one. And down below him, he can, like, see the battle in the city, like, raging raging on, like he's up in the sky. Oh, nice. And it's sort of like every... He's, like, talking about parrying and, like, pushing the Dark One back. And every time he does, his army surges forward. And every time the Dark One starts pushing him back, his army starts having to fall back. And he's like, their, so the outcome of their sword fight determines the outcome of the battle below. Sounds like a more literal version than uh, Ender's Game. Yeah. <laughs> A little bit. Well, that's the thing, is at the, the time, every time you meet with the Dark One, it's always like a vision, or, or like, they're in his mind or Corp- something like that. Incorporeal, essentially. Yeah. And then you find out, like, it zooms out, and there's a guy on a hill watching the city that this is happening in, and he literally sees a giant Rand and a giant Dark One <laughs> in the clouds fighting. Just to not have ham hand in this. Which is why, at the end of the second book, everyone knows he's the Chosen One, because he appeared in the sky over this battle mm-hmm. and killed the Dark One again. <laughs> How many times I gotta kill this dude, <laughs> man? Like, the Dark One's obliterated, Rand just gets stabbed, but his wound, like, doesn't heal, it's, like, all black and festering. It's, like, the... But yeah, the point, they, they find him, they, they're, they, heal, they heal him, he's, like, asleep for, like, two weeks or whatever... And while he's, he's like, in the tent, just being taken care of by his many love interests... Uh, <laughs> he Celine, has many waifus. Celine just walks in, and she's like, oh, hi, I'm Celine. Uh, I'm also, uh, you may know me by this other name. Uh, I'm basically an evil Ace to Die, who's also one of the 13 Forsaken Ones, who works for the Dark Lord. And uh, Rand is my love interest. Okay, bye. <laughs> walks into whose tent? Rand's. And tells him this? No, she, he tells it to all the people protecting him. <laughs> okay. I'm like, oh, okay. I thought they were going to play that up for a little bit. Like, no, she just fucks off for the last one third of the book. <laughs> and then literally just walks into his tent to be like, I'm supremely evil! And then walks out. 
I don't like that idea of it's just like I'm tired of people saying that the women are their love interest. He's my love interest. She's just like I claim him. I claim him for Wasn't myself. The, I claim him for Spain. <laughs> it's always Spain. It's always Spain. But yeah, that that I guess that doesn't have anything to do with anything. I just thought it was funny that like they spent this whole time. I guess that's yeah, that that's the point I was trying to make. The the whole thing about tension is that it can really work if it leads to something. <laughs> a non that was a non climax. It was a complete non climax. They spent the entire time being frustrated, and then instead of like it leading to some reveal or whatever, she just comes in like, "Hi, I'm one of the Forsaken." Bye. Mm. It's been nice knowing you. Yeah, I have evil powers. <laughs> I got the hots for this guy. And then her, his actual love interest is there. She's the only one there. And Rand is unconscious. And it's like, I, why don't you just kill her and then yeah. be fine? You get to be the uh, number one waifu. Then you'd I be mean, the only one here and no one would have any evidence. But she doesn't. She just leaves. She goes for harem type. <laughs> She's just like, I'm upset with you. I'm going to walk away even though I can blow up a planet. I, I, have, I have no idea. what. I guess that's another thing. When, when it comes to like the bomb under the table, mm-hmm. you know the stakes. I don't know anything about Celine. I don't know what her powers are. You know are. she's evil. Yeah, I just know, I know she she's up to no good, mm-hmm. but I don't know what she can actually do about it. <laughs> yeah. I don't know if she's just some conniving woman or if she's got spells. I know she has spells now. Well, that's a great way to lead into the power. How exactly <laughs> is that different? <laughs> yeah, that was the, the only other final thing that I thought was uh, really worth talking about this. Uh, was just the, the their their magic system. Because this is going to come up a lot in our future yeah. talks. Yeah, and uh, the terms uh, hard magic system and soft magic system are going to be probably thrown back and forth. Yeah, well, it's one of those things, I always thought I really liked hard magic systems. And yeah, I, 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 I mean, because it, 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 it feels structure, you, you feel it. Yeah, uh, but I think it's also one of those things where, like, everyone says they want a nice dark roast coffee until you give them it, and then they're like, Actually, I want it really creamy and watered down <laughs> with a whole bunch of sugar in it. We both worked at a coffee place, if you can't tell. Yeah. Well, no, that, that's a famous thing by, uh, I forget his name. There's some scientist who writes a bunch of arguments. And he talks about, like, what people say they want, what sounds good, isn't always what they want. Mm-hmm. When, you, when they poll people, a lot of people say they want a thick, dark roast because that's what coffee sounds like. Yeah. In reality, the popular thing is... <laughs> creamy if you give them a taste test they'll pick the creamy watered down sugary one but yeah a lot of people think they want the hard magic system but after again reading we we had the name of the wind the furies of calderon gentlemen bastards yeah that had magic it had magic but that was that was super soft magic system yeah that was a very off to the side yeah i guess the the hardest magic system i've read was the one from the name of the wind well it's that's a great uh example but that's probably some but it has both a hard and a soft magic system yeah but at least in the first one it's got a very hard magic system. yes yes the first book very very much focus on like sympathy and the we won't get into it, but it has a, the, the, a lot of the focus of the book is him learning how to do magic, and their magic is very much based on like physics and like transference of heat and energy and how you do that. And so far, I like the the uh, the Wheel of Time's magic system the best. It's super simple, but the way that it makes you feel when they talk about it is like I identified it with the most. It was the first time I like could imagine sort of like what it would be like to be a wizard. Yeah. And what makes it unique among all the magic systems, because even magic systems like, uh, you know, Fury of Calderon, very soft magic system. Now, uh, on that one, I would actually have to disagree. Uh, that one's actually a very hard system, but that's... It's based on, like, science? Oh, no, the how they... Hard and soft are very different in the sense that hard is uh, you set up the rules and perimeters, you set up what can and cannot be done, uh, and you tend not to deviate from that. It's kind of like the uh, the Avatar: Last Airbender, whereas like fi- wire- water benders have to have water, but fire benders can just create fire and all these different things. Whereas a soft magic system is kind of like Lord of the Rings, where things just happen. Things are just magical. Things are just magical. They are given properties and understanding as to what they're doing, but where it comes from and the specifics on what's happening aren't delved into as yeah. much. At least that's uh, reading the first Furies. It just sort of seemed like they're fire elementals. How powerful are they? Where do they come from? 
how exactly do you control them? What are the limits of what they can do? Never I, really explore. I feel like we'll get into that in an, uh, the, uh, another video for that. But yeah, uh, I can describe to you how that is very. It is a very hard system from just that first book and going forward. Ah. Either way, the point I was trying to make was like every magic system I've seen has sort of like had to do with like either you're pulling it, you're pulling the magic from yourself, mm-hmm. or like there are gods or like sprites or uh, like fairies or some sort of external source that you're like pulling magic from but it's usually like a polytheistic sort of source or it's like you channel nature itself in the, yeah. the case of the the uh avatar like you were mentioning there's like the four elements and you can channel those and in in a uh, in wheel of time they kind of have this like monotheistic religion they don't really go in depth into like how they worship or what they're they just mention like they have a creator and the creator has the one power and all all the Ace of Die, all the m- magic and stuff comes from being able to take just a little bit of that one power and channel it into whatever shape that you want it to take. Yeah, it's kind of a a, a battery source for the for your imagination. Yeah, essentially, but it, it's weird. Even calling it like a battery, they they do a really good job in the second book of sort of talking about how like when you can channel, it's like you're a flower, and the one power is. The, the source is like the sun shining mm-hmm. down on you and you need to be able to like take it into you to grow. And it's this thing like if you take in too much, then you could burst into flames or you take it in and then you try to do something with it. And it, it's really interesting, especially when it goes into the uh, you have the, the two female characters from the first book, Egg and uh, Niving, I think her name is. Naveen. Or, Naveen. But, yeah. yeah. Naveen. Uh, she was the village wisdom, and I I hated her in the first book because she her whole her defining aspect is that she's supremely stubborn <laughs> and like doesn't want to like anyone to think they're better than her and like really catty. But it really works in the second book because they're they go to the ba- basically they're being trained to be a Sedai. Mm-hmm. It goes through their training, and they talk about like uh, Egg has like the talent in the same way that most of them do. She can bring it in, and she can like channel. And she she has that whole thing. She imagines she's the fa- flower, and then there's a ball of light in her hand. She can make a ball of light. Hey, that's neat. But she doesn't learn to do much with it besides, like, she can make flames, and, like, maybe she shot a fireball near the end. Naveen, she can only channel when she's angry. Ah. <laughs> and it's like, she... they they. They keep trying to tell her to do this thing, like, imagine you're a flower, and it's coming, and she's like... Flowers. I ain't flowers. She's like, this is so stupid. This is... Why do I have to pretend I'm a flower? This is bullshit. This is all nonsense. You're all crazy. And they're like, do you want to learn or not? She's like... And basically, her teachers find that by annoying her is how (laughs) they can make her do stuff. But she's like... She imagines herself... She's a flower, and the... She can feel the light of the one power surging through her. But then when she gets angry, it's like the flower starts sprouting thorns. And then she, like, opens her eyes and, like, her teacher just goes flying across the room against the wall and is, like, stuck there against the wall. <laughs> the Ace and I are always on equal terms with each other because they can silence themselves, essentially. Like, they can cut you off from the one source. Just be like, I'm just going to put a cloud in front of that light and you are going to wither. Mm-hmm. They can do that to you permanently. It's called uh, gentling, gentling you, yeah. yeah. Which is what they do to men who can channel, um, because they they'll go crazy, because the male half of the one power is like corrupted and oily. Mm-hmm. So, which, thanks to that beginning part. Yeah, thanks to the breaking of the world, basically made the male half of the magic all corrupted. And if you use it, you go crazy after a little while. But yeah, it's one of those things like you hate Niven all through it. She's a bitch. She's stubborn. She doesn't <laughs> listen to anyone. And then they end up, they get tricked by uh, one of the, the bad Ace of Die, one of the ones who is from the, the opening. Yeah. And uh, they actually get enslaved by these other people who, uh, there, there's a whole nother, I won't even go into a whole lot of it, but there's a whole nother race of people that come over from the ocean, from across the seas. And they're the remnants of uh, this old empire that, like, fought against the Aes Sedai long ago. Yeah. And, like, they have Aes Sedai, but they have these collars around them where they can't channel unless someone is holding that collar. And even then, they can only do what they're told. Otherwise, they're like, 
If you try to hurt the person who ha- holds the collar, you get inflicted with double the amount of pain. Ah. And if you that person wants to, they can just like concentrate and make you feel pain. And they're like, it is it is very almost disturbing and like sad. But basically, they have Ace to die on leashes. Yeah, that sounds uh, kind of bad. That they like command, but it's one of those things like you know. It's an interesting contrast. Like, Ace and I are the most powerful here. In there, they're at the bottom rung of society. Yeesh. And they, like, they sail over and they immediately take over towns because Ace and I swore to never use their powers for violence. That's part of the thing. They can't get involved with wars. That's why all the nations haven't just dis- dis- just demolished them. each other, yeah. But the people from across the ocean, they're like, we don't give a fuck. <laughs> We're just going to come over and rain fireballs until you surrender. Do you surrender? We weaponized ours. Oh, you fought against us? Okay, we're going to, like, crucify every tenth person. Now, do not mess with us. <laughs> They're very brutal. And uh, Egg gets captured by them, and they try to train her to be an Ace to die. And when Nivian teams up with people and actually goes back and saves her, it is the most satisfying thing. Because all the, like... Suddenly, like, oh, she gets her power when she's angry and when she's stubborn and frustrated. And she is the most pissed off she has ever been. So she's just flinging people around. You, you have the, like, oh, they have these, like, trained Aes Sedai who have been trained from birth to fight. And they're, like, fireball. And she just, like, stares and, like, lightning comes down and just, like, destroys the whole building. I'm sorry, I got, I got again, I, I tend to go on rants. That's you why have we to do let, this. You have to let me know if you like these rants, just where I'm just like, mm-hmm. let me geek out about this. But yeah, the, the whole point of that was just to sort of explain how, despite the fact that it's such a soft magic system, that you can do everything, they manage to make everything that happens feel like it's earned. It never feels like they're just creating powers out of nothing, even though you have no idea what the limits of the Aes Sedai power are. They always feel kind of, like, connected to something. Yeah, that's what I mean. Like, that's why it's a hard system at some point. But it's also very, very soft because it the, the upper limits and what exactly it deals with are kind of murky. Yeah. But it's it, it's a nice—it kind of rides the line there, sounds well, like it. Especially, they, they make a big deal about how, like, they find all these artifacts and all these objects and stuff in the cities that were, like, created long ago when the Aes Sedai, when the one power was pure— when the men and the women worked together, they made, like, amazing things that they don't even understand how they did. Pressure cookers. <laughs> so it's like, you you know that, like, their power cap is way higher. Mm-hmm. But they, even then, they're like, and there's stuff from before that was maybe lost, and we don't know. And there's also artifacts that, like, boost power. The Angriel, they're called. Oh, the, Angriel? Yeah. Mm-hmm. They're just, like, little things. I think hers is, like, a... St- uh, what was it? The main Aes Sedai, Moriane, has like a little statue that she keeps in a silk cloth. But when she holds it, it lets her channel more of the, the one power. It, made, it lets more of the sun shine on her and so she doesn't burst into flames. Yeah. There's also, uh, what was it? I think they're called like Say Angriel or something. Say Angriel. It's something with Angriel. Something, something Angriel. But they're basically like big, huge orbs that are like buried in certain cities and Aes Sedai can channel through them. And they each have, like, a specific purpose, but they don't know exactly what that purpose is. <laughs> it picks up cable. It picks up cable. No, like, what was, there's one in the Tower of uh, Tower, Tower of Alon that uh, if you make an oath on it, you can never break it. Oh, so so these ones actually have, like, niche-specific yeah, things that they, they, they do. Yeah, niche-specific purposes, but they're like, for every one that we know what it does, there's 20s that, 20 others that we don't know what it does. And they're like, sometimes you get people who try to study them and they just burst into flames or they straight up disappear and no one knows what happens to them. (laughs) Like, this could be dangerous. Sounds like it'd be interesting, though. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, I I think that's just about everything I I wanted to talk about. Hopefully you enjoyed this. Did you have any other, like, closing remarks? Anything you'd like to ask about? No, go read uh, Wheel of Time. Give us what you think. Yeah, if you're interested or if you've already read it, let, let us know what you thought about our little discussion here. Uh, again, let us know if you... Not necessarily book recommendations yet, because like I said, we got our first five episodes planned out already. Mm-hmm. But stuff about the show itself, like what kind of format. Maybe should we both read the book? That might give you a little bit more to talk yeah, about. Yeah, a little bit more. Also, what do you think about the ideas of hard and soft magic and... 
pretty much all what what else do we all talk about there's a whole bunch of shit how do you feel about sort of like the tension of knowing something when does it get annoying oh but, yeah and the, the slow opening like this versus uh lord of the rings and everything mm-hmm. and I, I i thought of like the whole intro and everything but i didn't think of any way to end it They definitely exist. <laughs>